let's get into it. Um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Josh Fisher. I am a team lead at 1904 Labs uh, here in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we deal with, uh, well, currently the project I'm working on is is scaling out customer service organizations who have large uh, customer service reps. So um, a, lot of, a lot of natural language, language processing and dealing with the experience on how to design systems, applications, and bots that interact with them. Uh, the, the title of my talk, um, if you couldn't tell, is Releasing Binaries in the Incubator. Uh, and I, I'd like to say that the purpose of this talk isn't to get into the technical details of what the licensing requirements are and what the actual exact process you should follow is, because um, there's many other talks out there. I think one of the people listening today, um, Justin, has uh, probably more exact specifications on that. Um, what I'd like to share is just my experience and, you know, and things that I've learned and, you know, if, if it helps anyone down the road along the way, um, great. So the big rocks uh, of the talk is, you know, I got, I got three sections, right? So I'm going to build some backstory, build some context on why me, why I'm here, what project, uh, and where I'm at today. Um, then I want to get into my process of learning what the Apache way was with Heron in the incubator. Um, it's quite an interesting uh, deal for me. You know, it was, it was a pretty good experience. And then I want to get into more of the, the process we go through to release. Uh, some of the things we've learned, things we still have to do uh, to become, I think, a successful project. So I'm not going to get into the details of what exactly Heron does, but just to give you a high-level overview, uh, Heron, by textbook definition that was given to it, is a real-time distributed, distributed fault-tolerant stream processing engine. You know, and a few weeks ago, I was talking with Rich Bowen, uh, Rich, Rich Bowen on a feather cast, and he asked me, he goes, well, what's the definition? And I gave him this. He's like, what does that really mean? And, you know, I totally failed at that because I got caught up on camera and got nervous and set up, you know, uh, a bunch of technical jargon. It didn't make any sense. So Heron is a framework that helps you, the developer, write stream process or data processing jobs that processes data as those events occur. Um, a, a, a older technology, which is batch, which still works great, um, usually processes events after some time interval or um, some number of events occur. Heron processes events as they show up. So event shows up in the system, boom, it's processed. Um, and that ever, it never ending processing becomes what is known as streaming. So Heron is a stream processing engine. Uh, so, you know, kind of give some backstory of where Heron came from. Uh, 2014, it was uh, development started for that in house within Twitter. Um, Twitter had a had a self hosted real time framework that was built on Apache Storm, and from what I've understood is that they ran into some issues with Storm uh, at the time, and this is back in version 1.x something and it caused them enough to re um, to rewrite a system or to write a new system called heron which had a storm compatible api and the thinking was is that they'd write a new system that met the, their needs in this specific use case and they could take all their jobs that were running out in storm basically recompile them and rerun them in a heron system with minimal changes because uh, at the time they had many many jobs and nobody wanted to take the time to rewrite all the existing stuff that already worked uh, business logic wise um, I came in to the project uh, right about 2017-ish, late in 2017, maybe September. Um, this is prior to it actually being officially donated to Apache. Uh, it was still on, uh, it was still on my Twitter. Um, I was working on a project that dealt with, um, I was dealing with real-time fraud detection. So, you know, you'd go out to a merchant, you'd swipe a card, and then this card would go to a bank, and somebody would have to check and see if this card was fraudulent, and we had to do it in a certain uh, period of time. Um, one of the requirements of the system was is that we needed um, to be able to assemble jobs without having to write any programming logic so that developers could write the, the components of the job, and then business analysts could then put the jobs together who were um, familiar with fraud rules, et cetera. Um, we went through various streaming frameworks to see what would fit the solution. We looked at Apache Storm specifically. We looked at Apache Flink, and uh, we looked at Heron. Uh, but the one that came out 
on top was Storm because it had something called the Flex API. Flex API, you could create jobs in Storm or you could define jobs in Storm using the YAML syntax as opposed to Java, uh, which is Heron, which is what is, which is, what is in Heron. Um, I really liked Heron just from the research we've done on it, mainly because it had a shiny new website and it was a newer piece of technology. Um, but, you know, I had a lot of things to learn still. And so um, I felt like, you know, after a few months of learning, I felt like Heron was going to meet the job, was going to do the job better than Storm, um, just based on the certain specifications we had within our within our contract. Um, right about 2018, um, during this time, uh, Heron was actually donated to Apache right around 2018, and I started work on uh, something called the Eco API. Uh, Eco was a Heron compatible API for Storm Flux jobs. And the reason for this is that we could write the thinking is that you could write, you could take almost any job that was defined in Storm uh, via the Flux API and run it in Heron via the Eco API. And I did this because I felt at the time um, Storm was going to uh, fall over a little bit, uh, was going to was going to not be able to handle the load that we were going through, and we wanted to be able to be easily re move the logic we wrote in Storm and run it in another system with minimal changes. Uh, so right, yeah, a little bit after 2018, uh, I guess it was probably February in 2019. I got uh, committed back to the uh, to the Heron repo. Um, it was really cool. It was my first experience writing open source code. Um, probably the most rewarding work I've ever done um, as a professional today. And, um, you know, the story carries on. I was invited to become a committer you know, sometime later, maybe 2019, maybe 2020. I'm not exactly where I put that arrow on the timeline. And then it got done. And then I ran and then we came, I came into the project and I came into the incubator and we ran into all these issues, right? So, Heron came in. It was, it had, uh, it had a company backing it. I don't want to, you know, I shouldn't say backing. We had a company that had interest in it that was developing on it on their own professional time. And they ended up going a different route. And we had some fallout with the community. And some of the issues were licensing, some of them were ease of use. And I could go on and on and on. But we, we, we came into this. There was all kinds of issues. We were trying to release Heron out of the incubator, and nobody really knew what to do. We were all new at Apache. We all had to figure things out. And that's that's what I want to tell you about today. So I I took some time to think about like what is, what is my Apache way, and I had to think like, well, what is the Apache way, right? So I'm um, just. So everybody's on the same page. You know, I'll, I'll read this to you, not to read words you can't read yourself, but the Apache way is a living, breathing interpretation of one's experience within a community-led development process, right? So that's that's everything you experience within the incubator, within all the projects, the mailing list, everything. And, you know, coming into the incubator, I love the tech. You know, uh, coming into Apache, I love the tech. That was my passion. That was the thing that fueled me is I wanted to become good at Bazel or build system. I wanted to be, write C++ and Java and Python and all these things. You know, I, and I like doing that. But what I became most interested in was learning how Apache worked and how we had to navigate through what is needed to get releases out. That, that became the most interesting to me. So some problems. So we come, I come into the incubator, you know, fresh off the, you know, fresh on the project. And we had more than just these three you see here, but um, automation issues, which were, you know, how do we build artifacts reliably? How do we release them? Um, you know, how do we do all the things? You know, how do, how do we make easy development easier? Um, then we had licensing issues. We must have had licenses from every single possible license that was not compatible with Apache licenses that we had to find a way to remove. And that was, you know, removing code bases, that was picking one of the available licenses. And um, there was lots of things that we had to learn along the way that we knew nothing about. And finally, we had Bazel issues. Bazel's our, our build system. Um, Bazel is phenomenal in what it does, uh, but it's not for the faint of heart. And the reason I say that is when we, well, we took on, we started using Bazel before I was on the project, but I believe it was in the 
1.0 of that version. So when Bazel came out, it had limited functionality, but it allowed for extensibility. Um, so we have a lot of custom build rules that are within Bazel, and upgrades are very painful for us at the time still. Uh, we've had a lot of progress over uh, within that time, but, but even so, uh, it's still a challenge today. So the automation issues, well, you know, to not get into the details, but each one of these issues was solved by talking over the mailing list, talking over Slack. You know, it was, you know, I, I, the details of solving these were probably, you know, like I said, probably better to be uh, described by somebody, you know, by Justin McLean or, or you know, my, my experience, Dave Fisher, he was been super helpful. Um, but all of these issues were solved by talking with other people on the project. You know, it was, it was, it's, it's really amazing to know that I work with a group of people, you know, we donate our time uh, and we're all over the world. Some people are in California, some people are in Hong Kong, some people are in uh, the Northeast, you know, I'm in St. Louis and we all came together to fix these issues that seemed like a huge mountain. And the way we did that was communication, right? And so we use Slack and Slack's okay, right? Slack's, Slack's great for quick conversations, but the problem with Slack for us was that it limited our mentor's visibility in the issues we were having. So uh, one of the things that we still learned to, that we're still working on today is using our mailing list. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to the mailing list in, in a minute, but you know, so we got these three issues solved um, using communication. People were jumping in where they felt they could fix problems and problems got fixed. So. It took years to solve these problems, um, you know, because we would solve one, another thing would pop up. And, you know, these are just three big rocks I can think of. There were hundreds of other issues along the way. But after we got all of these done, you know, we stood up and we're like, yes, we're done. We're finished. We're ready to go. And then we had two more problems pop up. And that was our community dwindled down over the time that we took to solve these problems because hair on was rough to use. And two, Ease of adoption. Heron was rough to use um, or was tough to use. You know, there was a period of time where everybody that was on our team or, you know, that was working as a committer or volunteering as a committer and never people that were actually using Heron were building it from source. Um, building Heron from source takes 45 minutes. It can be painful. Like, and if you don't know exactly what you're doing, it can call it, you can get all kinds of issues. And because of this ease of adoption, you know, um, our crowd dwindled out. And so now these are our new, these are our new things we're facing at the moment in the incubator. And we still have a lot of work to do, but I think we all have the same, I think we're all trying to go the same direction. You know, um, you know, how, how do we solve it? Oh. Extra slide. There we go. Sorry. I went the wrong way. So, while going through the incubator, learning the process, talking with Dave Fisher, talking with Justin, uh, talking with all the other mentors that have uh, come and gone within the time I've been there, I found that talking through the mailing list and asking questions, being vulnerable, asking to say, being okay to say, I don't know how to solve this, helped us get things solved. You know, I'm talking from my perspective. You know, other people may have others. Or other people may have different perspectives. But I found that when I've got on the mailing list and we had no idea which direction to go and we just asked the, asked the question saying, I don't know which way to go, somebody would step up and somebody would help out. And it was amazing to see that. It's just great to see people come together. And, you know, I sat back and I thought about it like, well, what's, you know, everybody's got their own Apache way. It's 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 one's interpretations of their experience, right? And, and from and from what I went through in the incubator, and you know, kind of the lower times, the better times, and um, I found that clearing the path for the next person, or leveling the playing field, is my Apache way, right? Allowing anybody who's willing to do the work to step up. And empower them to do the work is what makes this open source uh, community a, a beautiful thing. And it, it's, it's magical when you give somebody the power to go off and do what they want and go off and create and what they come back with. Um, 
anybody I've ever asked to do anything or, you know, asked for help with, they've always come up with a better solution than I have. So um, definitely ask for help and definitely be open to any feedback. So let's get into more of the details of, you know, what we go through for the hair on release process. Um, oh, how far, how, how far we have come. We have made so many failed release attempts uh, with release candidates. I, I can't tell you. And I'm still learning today. So the, the point of this section is to tell you about what it is we go through so that if you're having trouble somewhere along the way, hopefully something I said will help you out. Or maybe, you, you know, we can touch point after this talk and, you know, I can give you more details on, 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 a, on a piece of what I spoke about. And also, um, anybody else who's listening who may know more than me can tell me what else I'm, what I'm still doing wrong. So, you know, we'll get there. So the, I think the overall release process for any project um, is probably pretty similar to high level, right? You create a tag, and I'm starting here at the left. You create a tag, a git tag, or, you know, I guess if you're an SVN, something different. Uh, you, create artifacts, you create artifacts from that source code tag. Uh, you sign and upload them um, to the, dis, uh, the distribution server, which is dist.apache.org. Uh, and then you vote on them. Um, if the vote fails, you start back over, you make your changes, create a new tag, and you go back through. Or if it passes, it goes to the general uh, list. And you do the same thing. If it fails, you start back over. Um, if it passes, um, you go to release. And I'll, I'll get into details what all these are in a little bit. Um, and once you release, you announce. I mean, it's it's as, um, I think it's as pretty simple as that. And the reason I'm sharing this is I had a really hard time for me, and maybe it's just my um, short attention span, but I had a hard time figuring out what the release process was. I mean, there's hundreds of Apache docs, um, but, you know, hopefully this will help somebody along the way. So to get all the way to vote on our, to get all the way to a vote on our private mailing list, right? So we create a tag, right? And we we create those artifacts um, from that source code tag. And that those artifacts are in our case, it's a targz file of the source code. It's Docker files, or it's a Docker image. It's um, it's install scripts, Maven artifacts, etc. And then we upload them to the uh, dist.apache.org to be voted on. Uh, when we send out the vote template, it's a pretty long, wordy thing, so I'm not going to sh uh, share it in this slide. But um, it's going to have a well. It's not going to have a list of commits. I don't know how that got stuck in the. the the slide, but just ignore that one. It's going to have the version we're voting on, the commit hash of the tag, uh, the source checksum, and then the instructions for building from source if uh, somebody so chooses. Uh, the vote goes on for a 72-hour minimum, and we're looking for um, three binding votes. Uh, binding votes come from mentors, um, not the committers on the project. Uh, one of the issues we ran into uh, which has recently been, been solved by, by a couple extra mentors that stepped up, is that Heron only had one mentor for a period of time. And getting three binding votes was impossible. You know, so we always had to, um, we always had to go 72, hour min 72 hours minimum, but then hope we get that one binding vote. And once that one binding vote would, would go on, we would then move it to general. Hopefully you have three um three mentors, you know, they're hard to come by, you know, it's people giving up their time is, is hard. Um, so, you know, if you have your committer, if you have your mentors, uh, treat them well and appreciate them. Um, so once we get to general, um, we do the same vote, you know, we have list of commits, version, get hash, check some instructions, and then minimum 72 hours. The nice thing is that if you have votes on your private mailing list, um, and let's say now you have three mentors and those mentors um, all voted on your private project for a plus one. Those votes carry over to general, you know, if they if they so bring them um, by default so that if that 72 hour window elapses and nobody in general votes, um, you still have those three binding votes from your private mailing list that will allow you to release. Um, in the fact, like we did, we only had one mentor and we only we usually only came to general with one binding vote. We had to wait until the community voted on us. Um, and sometimes you have to be a little persistent. Um, and that's just because there's plenty of projects out there and there's plenty of people with a bunch of other things to do. So it's um, it's 
getting their time is is valuable. Um, but, you know, just be polite. You know, people are busy. They have other things going on, but they're always willing to help. You just got to make sure to, um, if you need help, be loud. Ask for help. Um, if you don't know the answer to a question, say so, and somebody's willing to help you out. So after general, we release. And I remember the first time we released, I didn't know what to do. You know, it was like we, we passed our first um, – our first vote with source code only. And I can't tell you how excited I was. It was like, it was my first Apache release I ever created. And, and uh, Dave goes, well, you make the release. I'm like, well, what does that mean? And I'll get into those details in a minute. Um, so when we release now, originally for, for probably a year, we only released source, um, source code, non-compiled source code, because we were going working through several issues. Um, but now when we release, we release install scripts, which um, for three different operating systems, a, a TARGZ, a uh, compiled binary for Debian, Debian image, an official uh, Docker image, which is based on Debian, and then we have Maven, Maven artifacts. So what does release mean, right? So let's, let's go back to that question. What does releasing mean? So if you... When you, when you stage your files on the disk server, you have a path that you're allowed to commit to, right? And so our specific path is disk slash, I'm looking, starting on the left, and you go up to the top is dev slash incubator slash heron slash, you know, some version release candidate. Um, and yours is going to vary, but this is, whenever we commit for voting, everything goes to dev, dev slash, you know, project, you know, version number, whatever. When we release, all you do is an SVN move from dev to release. That's it. You just change that base folder. And it brings you to a whole new file structure, but those are your release branches. Or that's your release process. It's as, uh, it's as simple as that. It's an SVN move. I thought, I'm telling you, if, if, if anything could have done been done wrong, I've, I've done it. Um, I thought originally that once you committed stuff up to dev and it passed, you'd then pull that stuff back down and then re-SVN commit it to release. It's not how it works. Um, I learned this um, from sending a support ticket to Infra. Uh, it's just an SVN move. It's pretty simple. Um, so when we release, uh, when we're voting, we have install scripts. We have this um, Debian targz of compiled binaries. And we have a Docker image, which is a targz. Um, all of those are uploaded to disk.apache.org. Uh, those are voted on. And when we do an SVN move, we, we move all of these. Um, but a difference of the Docker image is that we create a Docker image from the targz file and upload that to Apache's Docker Hub. Um, we were given access to Apache's Docker Hub through Infra. Through infra. Um, you just got to create a JIRA ticket. Um, if anybody needs any help with that, um, I had to figure it out myself. I'd be happy to kind of walk you through uh, what I've learned. It may not be the right way, but at least what I've learned. And then Maven artifacts, um, we have some issues with. Um, we have to manually upload them to uh, repository.apache.org because Bazel does not, well, at least the last time I checked, does not allow for any, um, you can't just run a Maven deploy on a ba Bazel. It just doesn't work. Um, so Bazel, with Bazel, we have to create the artifacts, create all the signing files, and then manually upload them via the UI. It's pretty painful. Um, but it only takes about 20 minutes, and it hasn't been enough pain to justify me to figure out how to do it with Bazel. So that's what we go through for the moment. So to do, um, you know, we, we found that not everybody wants a Debian image. Some people want CentOS. Um, but with CentOS comes licensing issues, so we have to find some workarounds. Um, and then... Um, also PyPy artifacts. So um, Apache doesn't have an official organization within PyPy because if I if I remember correctly, PyPy doesn't offer organizations. So it's kind of on your own with that. Um, and we had one of the issues you ran into is that the old committing team um, that that had control of the Heron PyPy uh, account we couldn't get a hold of, so we couldn't release anything for Heron with uh, any, you know, for Python users. So everybody has been building for source for years. We recently got access to that and we're able to start releasing. So that's our next one. Uh, and finally, a lot of our release steps are manual. Uh, I think it's good in some sense. And I think it's 
a little painful in others. I, um, for instance, the Maven upload, the Maven uploads. I'd like to find a way to automate that and not make it so, not make it be so manual. But some of the release processes are manual for a reason, for security reasons, and um, it's just part of the process. Um, over and all, I think we've we've done pretty good with what we've learned with um, coming in with zero Apache experience. You know, getting some help. So mistakes I've made. Well, I there wasn't a slide big enough in the world for me to list out everything I've done wrong with an incubator, with an Apache or a hair on anything. Uh, forgetting to clean up after myself. So, you know, if you, if you remember how I said you do an SVN move to, you know, instead of dev, you go to release. Um, the only thing you keep in that, in that release folder in that release path is the most current release. So what happens is, is there's a background process that copies uh, releases to an archive to an archive uh, server that um, you, those aren't needed after a while. So you only keep your most current release on the release um, within the release path release path of the uh, distribution server. And this just helps clean up the load. Um, you know, Heron in particular, each one of its binaries are at least 500 megabytes. So it takes, you know, it takes up quite a lot of space. Um, and, you know, mistakes, that, like I've already said, not asking questions. Um, I'm a big fan of, you know, go ahead and do it and then ask for, you know, forgiveness later. Um, but it doesn't always work with Apache because then you got to do everything over again. So if you're not sure, ask a question. And if you can't, if you can't get the question, ask somebody else. There's always somebody willing to help us. Sometimes we're a little bit busy. Um, and then I got some other things, consistent artifact naming. I've messed up being consistent with um, releases and, you know, what the folders are named. Um, it's if you can script the process as much as possible, it'll make things so much easier for you as a release manager or a committer on a project. Um, and then the list goes on and I could go on for hours about everything I've done wrong. So uh, hopefully this talk wasn't uh, was, was informative and hopefully you, you've learned something from it. Uh, once again, my name is Josh Fisher. You can find me get my email here. Um, I'm on most socials at Josh Fisher 1108. Um, I don't do social much, so um, hopefully I'll catch you around. Thank you.